while on patrol, two officers, Nelson and George, were approached by an elderly black woman who needed their help. They started making fun of her, much to their dismay, but were shocked to learn her son's identity. Nelson and George were completely unprepared for what was ahead on that tragic day. They pulled over to the shoulder of the road and watched the vehicles going by. Every once in a while, a car would speed past, causing the speed reader to make a loud beep. However, the officers chose to engage in small talk instead of pursuing speeders. As Nelson skillfully guided the vehicle, George, content in his reclining passenger seat, propped his feet on the dashboard. They talked while listening to gentle music on the stereo. A tiny car went by and then stopped a ways away from them. An old black woman with a pocketbook emerged when the door swung wide. Nelson smiled and pointed out to George that she was hobbling when she walked over to them. George, who was looking at her in the rearview mirror, thought her limp was funny and made a remark about how stupid she looked while laughing. They exchanged glances, hoping for a playful exchange. As the woman approached and they realized she was making her way straight to their car, the police officers couldn't help but chuckle as the woman dragged her wounded leg behind her, making her struggle with every step. Their laughing burst into full-blown amusement when she paused by Nelson's window and leaned over to gaze at them, to keep from falling over. George took his boots off the dashboard, while Nelson, attempting to rein in his laughter, put his head on the driving wheel. The women just stood there, bewildered while the guys kept laughing at her. When she first arrived, she assumed they were laughing at a joke. It didn't take long for her to figure out that they were making fun of her. Standing there, she could hear the cops mocking and pointing just add fuel to the fire of their laughter. Their taunting made the woman feel both confused and hurt, being completely unfamiliar with her. She failed to comprehend their motivation for making fun of her, curious about whether something was wrong. She examined her clothing but found nothing unusual. She decided to face them, feeling both perplexed and upset. She leaned on the window and demanded to know, Why are you mocking me? The men's laughter ceased suddenly when she asked her query, and they gazed at her in shock. With an innate reflex, she retreated, and George imitated her speech, while Nelson accentuated her gestures. Because of this, they started laughing again, and Nelson was laughing so hard that he banged the wheel and inadvertently sounded the horn many times. He seems unconcerned. As the woman realized she was being made fun of by men younger than her own son for reasons she didn't comprehend. She stood there, she inquired once more, wanting to know what she had done to deserve this kind of humiliation, but all her queries seemed to do was make people laugh more. The officers had to wipe tears from their eyes from laughing so hard, she was going to yell at them since she was getting irritated, but Nelson motioned for her to step outside the car. She stood there, wondering why he would ask for anything so out of the ordinary. He told her he just thought it was funny that she was limping and that he wanted her to show it to them. She declined, offended by their actions. When she informed them she had been with them for more than ten minutes, they laughed at her. Not one of them had bothered to investigate her approach's motivation. She hesitated to leave, knowing that she would need their assistance to accomplish her mission. She tried again, talking slowly and softly, but they ignored her. She eventually lost her cool and began berating the officers loudly. She uttered, I'm really disappointed in you. It is your duty as law enforcement to serve and safeguard the public, not to make fun of them. You will lose your jobs as a result of this toxic behavior, so you must improve. She said that, and the laughter stopped for the second time that day, leaving a tense silence while Nelson and George stared at her. Nelson growled and demanded to know who she was. After responding that her name was Emily, she was shush-talked and informed that nobody was interested in her identity. Nelson then warned her not to speak up in front of law enforcement as a citizen, saying that he may consider it harassment and make sure she suffered the consequences. Emily was not deterred by his threat. She insisted on knowing why a stranger would be treated so badly by two officers who ought to know better, though their conduct had been anything but pleasant. The police were supposed to be the people's friends. Their outrage was aroused by this challenge to their behavior, and George questioned whether she was attempting to teach them how to do their jobs and how dare she teach them like idiots. They stormed out of the patrol car, glaring at Emily with burning anger in their eyes. They were going to find out why she was so daring to be so sure of herself. They laughed at her tiny car, thinking it almost pitiful, and all they saw was a weak, old black woman who was limping. They were unable to understand what gave her the courage to criticize them. They decided to give her a lesson she wouldn't soon forget since they felt mistreated by someone they didn't think was important. Emily wasn't the first to be treated so cruelly by them. Throughout their collaboration, 
they had frequently used harshness against civilians. During their time at the police academy, Nelson and George became a close friendship. Doing everything together and ultimately joining the same squad, they considered their assignment as patrol partners to be a dream come true and were overjoyed to receive it after graduation. Their relationship often took precedence over their work responsibilities. They would frequently park in remote locations to drink beer and talk, ignoring their obligations to keep an eye on traffic, as long as they were having fun together. They could watch cars go by at 100 km per hour on a 50 km per hour road without even blinking an eye. Sadly, people were the victims of this behavior. Nelson and George took great pleasure in making fun of people they saw on the street. They would frequently scream out and harass strangers. They would falsely threaten to arrest anyone displaying rage, accusing them of committing a crime and putting them in jail. Many choose to suffer in silence rather than report their abuse as a result of this intimidation. The cops persuaded themselves that they didn't need to be on guard because everyone was following the rules and the area they were assigned was tranquil. Nevertheless, one night during patrol, their transgressions caught up with them. Nelson observed a stunning woman strolling by the car as they normally did as they were parked by the side of the road, conversing and enjoying some music. He fell head over heels for her the moment he laid eyes on her and made up his mind right then that he was going to spend time getting to know her. He got out of the car and went over to her, but she rejected him the second he tried. She told him she was engaged and didn't care about him at all. Nelson seized her and started questioning her like she was a suspect while she attempted to flee. He insisted on knowing her origin and destination. Despite the young woman's assurances that she was returning home from work, her story went unbelieved by Nelson and George. They implied, whether they believed it or not, that she was concealing something by insisting that she couldn't have traveled that far. They told her to dump her belongings on the ground so they could examine them, even though she tried to defend herself, even though her ID was authentic when checked. She was wrongly charged of drug dealing and impersonation because of their claims that it was phony. They informed her that agreeing to date Nelson was the only way to evade accusations. She gave them the silent treatment and flat out refused. They kept their word and bundled her into the patrol cruiser, driving her straight to the station while shackled. As they tried to frame her, they threw her in jail and planted drugs in her suitcase. The woman's family connection to one of the state's highest paid attorneys turned the tables on the scenario. The station was mortified as the lawyer and his colleagues quickly shredded the false case. Please do not sue, the station pleaded with the woman and her family. As long as Nelson and George were punished for what they did, the family was on board. A disciplinary hearing was held for the policemen, covering their entire career, not only for this incident. Not only had they never made an arrest leading to a conviction, but their patrol area had the highest reported rates of automobile accidents and muggings because of how careless they were. It was obvious that their collaboration was limiting their efficiency. Upon their return from a six-month unpaid suspension, they were paired with different individuals. Their unsettling actions subsided after being separated since their new companions were respectable police who would not abide wrongdoing. It appeared like they were finally getting the hang of being competent police officers, but destiny has different intentions. Just as George's colleague was shot and hospitalized for rehabilitation after a robbery stop, Nelson's partner left on vacation around the same time, around a year after they started working separately. George and Nelson found themselves drawn back to one other when they were both single and no other officers were ready to take them on because of their history. They were overjoyed to be a team again and felt as comfortable as old shoes when they got back to working together. Their friendship deepened when they became used to each other's company. Later that day, they saw Emily and couldn't help but tease her, which elevated their spirits even more. They stood before her, questioned her identity once more, and wanted to know why she dared to address them in such a way. After telling them she wasn't afraid of them or interested in their assistance anymore, Emily said she would look elsewhere. Just when she turned to leave, she hurried back to her car, but George forcefully seized her elbow and pulled her back, while being pinned down and shoved against the patrol cruiser. She let out a scream. George cautioned her against losing her composure and escalating the matter. Emily refused to be held down and demanded to know what had she done to warrant her detention. After tiring of her objections, the police officers violently handcuffed her and filed charges of assault and threatening physical harm against her. Emily shouted that it was false, but they ignored her and proceeded to chuckle while charging her with resisting arrest. After that, they pushed her into the back seat of the police vehicle got in, and triumphantly drove back to the station. 
When they got to the station, they forced Emily through the doors and guided her to the booking section. Nelson and George had made up their minds to frame her for a moving infraction, saying she had threatened to beat them and attack them. She was arrested as a result of this false accusation, even though their assertions were unsupported by any proof, as they brought Emily to the counter, where they overheard their captain ordering her around and conferring with a secretary. It was their word against hers. Both cops pushed Emily in front of them like a caught trophy, trying to look as professional as possible as they approached. The captain turned and his eyes grew wide with astonishment and despair at what he saw. Mom, he cried out. The two cops halted for a time, looking at each other, bewildered, but the captain's voice boomed back, demanding to know why his mother was handcuffed and what had transpired. The officers stammered as dread gripped them and they tried to speak. Their mother, the captain, had been arrested, Emily could not hold back and took the floor. She described how George and Nelson had made fun of her and tormented her without any justification, accusing her of assault in order to get her arrested. The older woman's visit was unusual because she frequently traveled the world for her humanitarian efforts. Her return to the nation was symbolized by this journey. And she made the decision to see her son at work. She knew the police station where he worked, but that was as far as she could go in her search for him. Her strategy was to seek directions from any police officer she came across in the town. She had assumed it would be an easy assignment, but sadly, she encountered Nelson and George. She was obviously in need of assistance, yet they showed no interest in helping her, rather than advice. She was treated with contempt. She was made fun of by Nelson and George, which made an already difficult situation even worse. Despite the entreaties of both officers, the captain declined to pardon them, since their suspension, they had not collaborated before, and it was clear that they had not learned anything, they committed the same crimes that had earned them their punishment again, this was their last opportunity, additionally, they would not have another chance, their disobedient actions had gone too far. After being brought back to her car, Emily was escorted to the captain's house, where she was to wait for him until he returned later that afternoon. The force had had enough of Nelson and George, so this was just another disciplinary hearing, nothing complicated. The force wasn't ready to give them another chance because they hadn't learned their lesson the first time, after being fired from the police department. They remained the same as the people they had so much liked making fun of and demeaning. The result astounded the other cops. All the money and time they had wasted in the academy had been wasted. And their careers were done. They were in disbelief that it was really over for them. They felt bad for bothering Emily and all the other people they had treated badly. It was a painful lesson discovered. After watching the first story above, do you have any thoughts? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. Now, let's watch another similar story. An old black woman was the target of widespread ridicule from the restaurant's personnel when Diana came back the following day. There was an immediate silence as she walked in. The world seemed to have come to a halt as all eyes were fixed on her. She was taken aback by the absence of assistance due to her advanced age. At her regular restaurant, she would normally receive kind treatment, including a guard who would help her with the door and a waiter who would show her to her seat. But here the workers stared at her strangely when she walked over to a vacant table and took a seat, despite being plainly visible. The waiters paid her no mind when she patiently waited for her order to be taken. Diana tried to grab their attention by raising her hand, but nobody paid any notice. Diana finally made up her mind to do something about it, to grab the attention of a passing waiter. She delicately patted him on the arm, however, he quickly recoiled and yelled out, Don't touch me, lady. The volume of his tantrum caused the other patrons to glance over. Diana remained seated in the hopes that another member of staff would arrive to assist after she was surprised by his impoliteness. Smiles and warm banter greeted other customers as she watched. The young woman walked away silently after huffing and puffing at another server. No improvement came from the waiter who was clearing the table next to Diana. Even after she tried to communicate with him, the waitress scoffed and purposefully dropped her coffee cup. Causing it to pour down Diana's clothing, Diana was left to wipe herself up while the waiter absentmindedly picked up the plates and strolled away, letting out a faint laugh. Diana was becoming more and more distraught over the closure of her beloved restaurant. She longed for the welcoming environment and the familiar faces that had made her feel at home there. Diana opted to approach the counter staff immediately. The clerk at the counter was staring down at Diana with contempt as she chewed gum loudly. The employee was very direct in saying, we can't serve you, why not? Diana inquired, her voice quivering ever so slightly. The employee said, 
our food isn't for someone like you, and then waved his hand dismissively in Diana's way. Diana, bewildered and wounded, continued by inquiring about the meaning of someone like her. A co-worker was summoned by the irate employee after she threw up her hands in frustration, as the second employee approached Diana, she smiled artificially before telling her she couldn't have their service and politely but forcefully told her to leave, Diana inquired when she felt tears forming in her eyes, the possibility that it was related to her skin tone began to nag at her, staff worker attempted to dismiss her by claiming they were overbooked and couldn't accommodate her. They needed to give priority to the regulars who came in more often and spent more money since they had fewer resources, she said. Diana clarified that all she wanted was to be treated equally and that she was prepared to pay for her dinner. She was considering this eatery as a potential new regular hangout and believed it may be a nice fit. The employee, who was still trying to maintain a grin, said that Diana didn't meet the restaurant's stringent policy of only serving regular customers and that it wasn't personal. The first server went on to say that because of staffing shortages, the restaurant was unable to spend time with customers who might not value their excellent service. Diana was not convinced by this. There was more than enough staff in the restaurant, too many, she thought. She observed that three of the waiters were not working, instead, they were casually conversing. When she saw that these were only thinly veiled attempts to cover up their bias, her heart fell. Seeing the discussion from the counter, a different staff member went up and offered that Diana might feel more at ease somewhere else where the environment was more conducive to her requirements. Diana questioned what they meant by that, and the employee just shrugged and said that their restaurant followed a standard that might not be appropriate for everyone. Diana was feeling really sad as she stood there. The awful truth was that they simply did not want her there. The flimsy and plausible justifications did nothing except conceal the discrimination she was subjected to. She turned to go, feeling unwelcome and ashamed. She heard two employees making fun of her and snickering as she was leaving the counter. They were doubting if Diana had even looked around before entering, and they were asking each other why she believed she would be served there. Diana was incensed by their harsh remarks, so much so that she spun around and insisted on seeing the manager. The crew called for him, unfazed. Diana was met with a look of astonishment and contempt when the manager came, as he was obviously taken aback that she was permitted entry, he told her to get out right away. Diana was shocked by the disrespect, she refused to back down. Stating that she was a first-time customer who deserved respect because she had been a paying customer next door for years, the manager, on the other hand, refused to listen and snatched her hand roughly before dragging her to the door. A new customer entered while the manager was dragging the old woman out. He froze in place, his eyes going wide at what he saw. He was wearing a professional suit, clearly startled by the situation. He asked, Hey, what's going on here? He was the lone voice in the diner, speaking above everyone else. The manager, who was still holding on to Diana, gave the man a frustrated look before retorting that it was internal restaurant business and unrelated to patrons. Relentlessly, the man asked, Do you know who this woman is? He gave Diana a stern glance. The manager and other employees regarded the man with disbelief, perceiving her as just another elderly woman stirring up trouble. The man told them that Diana had been an army physician for 35 years and had won numerous medals for her work, shaking his head in dismay. She was a champion. Among the other patrons, there was a murmur of astonishment. A few acknowledged her by nodding. The management remained unaffected in spite of this, with a dismissive shrug. He said that their cuisine was unfit for senior persons such as herself and that they did not serve them. Diana cast her eyes across the room and noticed two middle-aged motorcyclists one in his seventies and the other in his eighties, enjoying a leisurely meal. Despite her efforts, the manager paid her no mind. With one more shove, he forced Diana out of the diner, his intention clear, to escape from her. Diana lost her footing and collapsed to the floor while the employees cackled mercilessly. Diana, in agony and shame, reluctantly got to her feet and walked away. At the same time, the patron reprimanded the restaurant manager. However, the manager showed little concern over the matter. In his view, his conduct could not be intervened with. The wait staff at the restaurant had no idea what lay in store for them the following day. Like nothing had transpired the day before, the wait staff continued their routine duties at the restaurant. They went about their daily business as usual, chatting amongst themselves and serving customers. A procession of shiny black automobiles flanked by police motorcycles arrived outside the eatery just before lunchtime, incredulous. The employees cranked their necks to identify the visitor. 
The sight of the governor stepping out of one of the vehicles stunned everyone. The management wasted no time getting the employees to work, ordering them to put away their seats and clean up the area. Making a good impression was their top priority. The manager was overjoyed, thinking the governor was in town for a business lunch or formal occasion. His initial elation was soon replaced by bewilderment and terror upon witnessing the governor assisting an elderly woman in exiting the vehicle. He had rejected the same black woman the day prior. The governor, a grimace etched over his face, walked side by side with Diana. The governor escorted Diana to a seat when they entered the diner. As soon as she was at ease, he insisted on seeing the entire restaurant crew right away. Accompanying the governor was the restaurant's regional supervisor, who stood close by, exuding an equally solemn air. With anxious glances back and forth, the staff huddled together. It was obvious that this was not a small matter when their supervisor was seen standing by the governor. The governor's wrath was obvious. He stared at the manager with fiery, trembling eyes. Beginning with, I am appalled by what happened here yesterday, the governor said more. Diana is an honorable veteran and a recognized member of our nation's military community. Instead of the shameful treatment she endured at the hands of your employees, she deserves our highest regard. As the manager fumbled for words to explain, the governor abruptly ended his attempt. He informed the management that such conduct had no place and that it was intolerable to treat anyone in such a manner, particularly someone who had served their nation honorably. The governor did place a high value on Diana. She was his father's army medic and she helped him recuperate from serious wounds he had received while serving. Her presence was crucial to my father's survival, the governor remarked. From that point on, she has been an integral part of our family, and I consider her a mother figure. Diana had served her country honorably for 35 years as an army medic. She faced several challenges throughout her career, yet she never gave up or gave in. Diana joined the Army Nursing Corps early on motivated to make a difference, in a world where black women had few chances, coming from a tiny area where opportunities were scarce, she saw joining the military as a way to make a difference. Throughout her career, Diana devoted herself wholeheartedly to saving lives and providing care, frequently doing so in hazardous settings, she received a slew of accolades and the admiration of her contemporaries for her bravery and perseverance, Diana maintained her empathy through thick and thin, an outstanding medic. She was known for her gentle touch and kind nature. Her colleagues admired her dedication to the job, and her patients trusted her implicitly. Diana held on to her community service after leaving the army. She helped individuals in need by volunteering at the hospitals and clinics in her community. She encouraged young people to seek careers in healthcare and service by serving as a mentor to them. Diana's efforts were well known to the governor, who had known her for a number of years. The governor's father was a devoted soldier and a devoted father who served in Vietnam when he was a young boy, and his family loved him dearly, sadly. Above the Vietnam jungles, his father's helicopter was shot down. After the helicopter crashed, he was returned to base critically hurt and on the verge of death. The circumstances were dire, and many people thought there wasn't much chance he would survive. The number of casualties at the base was overwhelming the medics. The governor's father appeared to be incurably injured leaving him in serious condition. The majority of medical professionals gave him morphine to relieve his discomfort and accepted that he wouldn't make it. They saw him as a lost cause. One medic, though, had an alternative perspective on the situation. In spite of the dire diagnosis from her supervisors, Diana persisted in her efforts to help the wounded soldier. She couldn't stand to witness a life lost without giving it her all because she thought he had a shot. Diana took it upon herself to take care of him. Defying the commands of her superiors, she remained by his side, caring for his wounds, giving him medicine, and keeping an eye on his vital signs all day and night. Her commitment was steadfast. She took care of his wounds, treated them, made sure he was hydrated, and battled the illnesses that were threatening to kill him. Countless nights were spent awake, watching over him and her other patients. Other medical professionals first believed Diana was wasting her time. But as the days dragged into weeks, a miraculous thing started to occur. Her careful attention to the soldier's needs caused his condition to gradually become better. His wounds started to heal, his vital signs stabilized, and he started to show indications of recovery. Diana's resolve and optimism were beginning to bear fruit. His sudden improvement became known throughout the base, and soon the higher authorities were paying attention. They observed that the soldier, who was previously considered hopeless, was making an amazing comeback. Although Diana's supervisors were initially irritated by her disobedience, 
they were unable to ignore the outcomes of her efforts, he had a chance because of her remarkable dedication and her persistent faith in her patient, it was evident that the soldier had a higher chance of surviving after weeks of intense treatment, he was able to have more therapy in the United States after his condition had improved. Diana's unwavering efforts were what ultimately saved his life, even while the U.S. medical team continued to provide him with care, he would have surely perished in that field hospital in Vietnam if she hadn't intervened, Diana's generosity to his family stayed with the governor, who was a small boy at the time, he recollected the fear and anxiety in his mother's eyes. The restless nights spent in prayer for his father's recuperation, and the day they learned that his father would be all right because of Diana's bravery and commitment, Diana became more than simply a family friend after that, to them, she was a hero, having provided the governor and his family the opportunity to maintain their unity, she took on the role of a second mother, Diana had the governor's unending thanks, he spoke about her with a great deal of respect and admiration. Diana had a significant influence on his life during those crucial weeks in Vietnam, they also influenced his belief that an individual may have a profound impact on the lives of others, which motivated him to choose a profession in public service, as a result of their ignorance about Diana and her significance to the governor and his family, the staff listened in stunned and embarrassed silence, as the governor went on, it started to on them how serious their actions were. He disclosed that the client who had challenged them the previous day had informed the authorities, who had subsequently taken the issue to the municipal council, the governor had swiftly learned of the situation due to his friendship with the mayor, when asked about the situation, the governor stated, I am deeply disappointed in all of you, his voice quivering with rage, this kind of behavior has serious consequences. Diana was formally apologized to by the restaurant chain's regional supervisor, who had accompanied the governor, he told her that their standards did not include such behavior and apologized for the situation, a repetition will not happen again, he assured, the incident's manager and staff members were subsequently addressed by the supervisor, you are all fired, effective immediately, he thundered, this kind of behavior is unacceptable and will not be tolerated, everyone on staff including the boss, was taken aback by the sudden dismissal and stood there in disbelief, a few tried to speak out, but the boss shot them down with an icy stare, they would not have any luck finding employment in the industry going forward, he told them, because word of their actions had already spread, realizing the seriousness of his behavior too late, the manager walked out of the restaurant with his head lowered as the crew departed, some in tears and others in startled silence. He had been especially harsh to Diana, especially hard for the nasty waiter who had first turned down Diana was the realization that no business would want to employ someone with such a shameful past, even though he needed the money from the job to pay for college, the governor returned his focus to Diana after dismissing the disruptive personnel, he gave her a kind grin and invited her to a celebration in her honor, in honor of her life and work, the eatery planned a celebration. Diana grinned gratefully and whispered, thank you, even though she was still reeling from what happened the day before, thank you for that, nodding, the governor gave the signal, you deserve it, meticulous preparations went into the tribute to Diana, beautiful decor and high quality linens completely changed the atmosphere of the restaurant, community members, veterans, and local leaders were invited. Everyone was so excited to be a part of the party that night that the restaurant was packed, unlike the cold and unwelcoming place Diana had encountered only days earlier, this one was filled with warmth and welcome, in an impassioned statement, the governor spoke of Diana's impact on his family and the stories she had told of her service, the overwhelming show of solidarity drove Diana to tears, sitting at the head table with her friends and well-wishers. She experienced a deep sense of relief and fairness, even though it had been a terrible experience, it had also shown how powerful it is to resist abuse and how good things may emerge out of it, as the guests cheered, Diana felt incredibly happy and grateful, despite all the difficulties she had encountered in her life, one particular moment made them all worthwhile, she felt validated as she looked around the room at all the people who admired and valued her work, throughout the evening. Guests came up to Diana to praise her and show their appreciation, it was a night to celebrate Diana's accomplishments as well as the kindness and selflessness she personified, a special ceremony marked the event's conclusion, as the governor gave Diana a plaque honoring her efforts and years of service, for Diana, it was a simple gesture of gratitude, but it meant the world, tears filled her eyes as she accepted it, feeling incredibly honored. Diana had so much gratitude in her heart that evening when she exited the restaurant, 
she was overwhelmed by the love and support she had gotten, she was aware that her story had impacted a lot of people and hoped it would encourage others to treat people with respect and kindness, this incident demonstrated that compassion and goodwill can triumph even in the face of hardship, after watching the stories above, do you have any thoughts, feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. If you enjoyed our video, please like, subscribe, and share our channel, that all about today's stories, see you next time.